Previously, I have a ton more of these stats related questions left to cover. So if you would like to see a part 2 to this, then definitely let me know in the comments below. Well, um, looks like we're doing a part 2. Fans of Breath of the Wild are accustomed to understand that this game is filled with a ton of unknowns, and not all of its vast systems are prone to simple player discovery. From figuring out things such as how the seemingly random Yiga Clan spawning works, to understanding how jump and spin attacks affect damage output against enemies, and more, today we will be covering 15 more of your stats related questions in this game, which can all be used to help significantly improve your future playthroughs. But enough chit chat, let's get right into the questions. The first question asks about how igniting a weapon on fire affects its durability, since it's pretty commonly known that having a flame-induced weapon will cause it to eventually burn up. Surprisingly, this fire never deals damage over time as you would expect, but instead will break after a full 60 seconds of continuous flame, regardless of how much durability it has. One useful tip for preventing any of your weapons from burning up completely is to just put it away before the 60 seconds are up and reignite it, as this completely resets its timer. Arrows also work off a similar system upon being ignited, except they only stay for 10 seconds and don't consume the arrow when burnt up, and torches are the one weapon that's completely safe from burning up entirely. The next question goes over a very sought after section of information. How does the inventory sort mechanic work? As for just about every section of the inventory, you are allowed to sort the items you have by pressing Y, but the game never explains what criteria it's sorting by. I'm sure that most people know that all armors have two sorting options, one for the full sets and one for body type, either headwear, chest wear, or leggings. And for the materials, they are all sorted in a predetermined order. But for the weapons, bows, and shields, it seems to be a bit more complicated and random. But after breaking it down, it was a lot simpler than I originally thought. The first sort option sorts purely by the number beside the weapon from highest to lowest, with the only exception being the melees, which first sorts one-handed, then twos, then spears. And the second option, the one people seem to be the most confused about, quite simply just sorts by compendium slots in the Hyrule Compendium, from lowest to highest. And the only exception is the melee breakdown of the one-handed's first, then two-handed's, then spears. I really thought that there was a lot more to it, quite honestly, but I'm just glad that I finally found an answer. The third question asks about the stamina consumption rates behind all tiring actions in this game. And well, we have answers for that. For running, a single wheel takes 3.3 seconds to deplete regardless of incline, which is fairly simple. Swimming stamina depletes exactly 10 times slower than sprinting at a rate of 33 seconds a wheel, with swim dashes consuming an eighth of a wheel, and upgraded swim dashes via set bonus consume a quarter of that, or a 30 second, which actually makes it more efficient than raw swimming. For flying, a single wheel gets consumed in 35 seconds, so again, very simple. For climbing, a full wheel takes 38 seconds to diminish when going upwards, with a hop consuming 31% of your wheel, and a stamina set bonus one consuming half of that, but more on climbing in a bit. Because finally, for bullet time, the stamina will get consumed exactly 10 times faster than climbing at a rate of 3.8 seconds a wheel, and shooting does not affect its consumption. Whew, I know that was a lot, but if you ever get tuckered out by using all your stamina, it will always regen back after exactly 4.5 seconds, regardless of how many wheels you have. But while on the subject of stamina and climbing in specific, how does the rain affect this, and how often does Link slip? Well, we'll get to this in a second, because there's a couple more interesting details I want to go over about the climbing system first. 1. Climbing actually consumes 50% less stamina if you are going sideways or downwards, meaning that climbing on an upwards diagonal will consume somewhere in between that. And 2. Stamina will deplete faster if you have a speed buff equipped. So if you have a level 3 speed buff which increases climbing speed by 40%, you'll consume stamina 40% faster, meaning that extra climb speed will not affect the max distance of the climb. Sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, because when it comes to climbing in the rain, the speed or direction does not affect the rate at which you slip as it'll always be a random amount of time between roughly 1.5 and 4.5 seconds after your last slip. I wish there was an exact algorithm to calculate this, but there is not. 
Considering that a single slip takes up an eighth of your stamina wheel, I usually avoid climbing in the rain at all costs, because this stamina drain is one of the major annoyances that you really can't do anything about. But speaking of stamina and major annoyances, have you ever tried playing a session of Breath of the Wild for an extended period of time just to realize how unergonomic holding your Switch can be? These Joy-Cons are tiny with no comfortable backing to support your hands for long-term play. I know that this used to be my problem until I got the Zengra Pro from Satisfy, a comfortable, ergonomic solution to anyone who loves using your Switch in handheld. The asymmetric design is perfectly crafted around dual analog play, which is what a game like Breath of the Wild is centered around, and boasts major improvements for people with both small and large hands alike. It even comes with thumb pads that help immensely with precision analog control. I honestly couldn't recommend this grip enough. And the best part is, not only are these grips affordable, if you use my discount code CROTON10 at the checkout, you'll receive an additional 10% off your order. And yes, this also applies to their Elite Bundles, which contains a sturdy carrying case complete with game slots and pouches, and an ergonomic charging cord you won't risk bending during longer play sessions. If you are interested in purchasing, please check out the shop link in the description below, as it'll greatly help support my channel channel, and most importantly, your future adventures across Hyrule. But speaking of shops, this leads us into the fifth question of this video. How does Breath of the Wild's shop restocking system work? Because shops will generally restock their goods at midnight every day, but there are a few exceptions that could prevent their goods from reappearing. One, if you stay within the general area of the shop when it hits midnight, then that'll prevent it from restocking until the following night. And two, which has to deal with arrows in specific, shops will never restock arrows if you have more than 50 of that type in your inventory, which was likely done so you can't just buy your way to max arrows with these. And while on the subject of restocking, let's take this a step further by talking about general object respawning and how all things respawn in this game. As we know, Blood Moons are events responsible for regenning all monsters and weapons in the world, but just about every other object works off a totally different system. Objects such as trees and boulders will always respawn when the game is reloaded as they are stored on the RAM. Things like chests and decayed guardian loot are one-time consumables and therefore don't respawn, and for everything else such as loose plants, ore deposits, and other types of materials, well, here's where things get tricky, as all these objects spawn under what's called a random revival algorithm, where every real life minute, every section of the world has a 1% chance of having all of its materials restored. And when I say section, I mean that this game is actually split into 80 distinct zones for this, and every single minute, each zone gets a 1% chance of being restored, which I know is definitely more complex than it needs to be, but this explains why some objects can take literal hours to respawn due to the randomness. And just like the shop restocking, staying in that area when it's trying to regen its materials will stop it from happening completely. So even if you mess up that Korok puzzle with the fruits and the trees, you may be waiting a long while for them to regen, and staying in that area won't help with that at all. Okay, that was definitely one of the longer ones to go over. But this next one has to deal with the durability loss of shields when facing guardian lasers in specific. Because it seems that even the strongest ones will break in a single hit when it feels like they shouldn't. Although we already went over how shields take durability in some of the previous videos, their interactions with guardians actually work under their own rules, as one hit will deplete exactly 30 durability from it, regardless of what the number or guard stat says. And since most shields have under 30 durability anyways, that is why they almost always break in one hit to them. This also applies to any type of bomb, whether remote or bomb barrel, which also do a flat 30 damage each. This next question asks about the mechanics behind using stasis to launch an object, and the methods needed to achieve max velocity. As we see, different types of attacks and weapons are responsible for storing more or less momentum in an object while stasising, which actually has nothing to do with the damage output of the weapon, but rather what class of weapon you're using against it. For one-handed, it'll take 13 hits to achieve max velocity, for two-handed, it takes 7, and for spears, it takes 16. What's interesting about this is that each one of these equates to three attack combos from the respective weapon type plus one extra hit. Cause one-handers combo in groups of four, two-handed in groups of two, and spears in groups of five. And that one extra hit can be from literally anything, including an arrow or just another hit. 
Just know that with arrows, only one hit can apply for momentum in a stasis chain, and the rest are surprisingly duds, so they're great for changing the direction of your object, but contributes hardly anything for the power. The only exception being bomb arrows, as each one has the power of a one-handed strike, meaning that a simple 3 blows from a 5-shot bow will be a quick way to guarantee max velocity. Speaking of stasis though, this question asks about the properties of using stasis plus on an enemy, specifically with the durations they stay frozen for. Although it seems that stasis works very differently across all the different types of enemies, realistically stasis duration only changes between two exact values, 5 seconds and 2 seconds. The 5 second freeze duration applies to all the red, blue, and one shot normal enemies, and the 2 second freeze applies to all the black and up, and also the bosses, so it's actually a lot simpler than most have initially realized. For the 10th question, we're gonna go more into explaining game systems again, specifically with how the Yiga clan spawning works. These guys will start spawning in the world at random as soon as you have obtained the Thunder Helm from their hideout, but there are actually several rules that come into play and locations that block them from coming after you entirely. 1. All the highlighted zones which include the Elden area, Lineru, and more are Yiga dead zones, meaning that they can't come after you in these places. 2. If Link is in any body of water, riding a horse or the master cycle, or even on a really steep cliff, as this also blocks the spawns. And last but not least, 3. Their spawns will also be blocked if the time is within any of the following ranges, midnight to 4am, 1pm to 5pm, and 7pm to 9pm. Other than that, there are no exact spawn locations for them, as they are all dynamically placed by the game assuming none of the negative conditions have been met. The next question has to deal with the stats behind Monster Extract, and how exactly they can affect the properties of a meal when used as an ingredient. And as it turns out, thanks to user Cobalt Alchemist from the Breath of the Wild Reddit page, this material can change three distinct properties of a dish at random. It's Effect Duration, Potency, and Health Restored. For duration, an extract will set the value to either 1 minute, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes with an equal chance of all. For potency, a dish will generally have either a 60 or 80% chance of staying what it is, a 20% chance of going up a tier, but also either a 20 or 40% chance of going down a tier. And for health points recovered, an extract has a 50% chance of making it stay the same, a 25% chance of giving 3 extra hearts, but also a 25% chance of getting the hearts reduced by a quarter. It's kinda crazy to see just how much these things can affect the quality of just about any food you make, but if you plan on staying consistent with your cooking, then this may not be the best option. The 12th question asks about the stats behind Epona, the amiibo-only horse, and how she supposedly differs from the rest of them. Although I made a full horse stats video a few months back, I never included any info about her, as at the time, I didn't know she had any unique properties beyond the high stats. But as I soon found out, the one unique thing that she does have to the other horses is a much longer spur duration than any other horse in the game. You see, whenever you use a spur to speed up any other horse into a gallop, this will last for exactly 3 seconds until they retreat back into a canter. But with Epona and only Epona, this will last for 4 seconds, which I know isn't anything too significant, but it's an interesting and unique detail that can actually really help for speedier trips across the land. Speaking of that horse video though, for those of you newish to the channel, I have a full playlist full of informative Breath of the Wild content titled Stats of the Wild, where we cover topics from elemental weapons to detailed cooking stats and way more, so be sure to check it out after this and possibly subscribe here so you won't miss any future content to come. But for now, let's get into the last few important questions. The next question asks about a big misconception about this game that most players still don't know the answer to. How do spin attacks and jump attacks affect the damage output of a weapon? As it's assumed that a higher jump or a longer spin may make them more powerful. But in actuality, the only thing a longer charge will do is increase the range of a spin attack, and a higher jump will increase the radius of a shockwave. But the damage of everything that gets hit remains constant to the base attack power of your weapon. The only exception to this is the Wing Cleaver, as each charge level will increase the damage of the weapon's iconic Wind Beam. A base shot will deal 10 points of damage, a tier 1 charge will increase it to 20, tier 2 to 30, and a max tier 3 charge will boost it all the way to 40 damage. 
along with a pretty hefty radius that's sure to knock any pest away. Speaking of misconceptions though, the next one asks about the whole waterfall swimming mechanic, and if wearing the Zora set or any other speed boosts will help with the speed of it. This is pretty important, because still to this day, I see a lot of Breath of the Wild players change into their full Zora set whenever they want to swim up a waterfall, as they think it'll help with speed, but this is actually never the case at all, as there is no way to change the speed of swimming up them, so there's absolutely no need to get out more than the tunic, unless you want to complete the aesthetic, which I guess there's no arguing with that. But speaking of speed, this gets us into the very last important question of the video, and that is asking about how Ravio's helmet can affect climbing speed, as it isn't like your normal speed buff. For those of you who don't know, Ravio's helmet is said to increase horizontal climbing speed, which is a reference to the horizontal wall running you can do in The Link Between Worlds, the game it originates from. But exactly how much faster can you go with it, and does it stack with the other speed buffs? As explained in our stat buff video, a level 1 speed or climb buff increases climb speed by 20%, level 2 by 30%, and level 3 by 40%. But the Ravio helmet by itself boasts an incredible 60% climb speed buff when moving sideways. And not only can this buff stack with the speed buff, it does so multiplicatively. So instead of combining the 60% with the 40% to climb 100% faster, the 40% gets added first to the base speed, then the 60% applies to the new value to create a speed buff of 125%. Although that extra 60% goes away if you climb vertically, climbing in any diagonal direction will still give you half that buff, so the results are still vastly apparent. Regardless, this combo will allow you to easily fly across the sides of mountains with ease, and I highly recommend it to anyone who wants to excel at scaling the world. But anyways, those were 15 more stats related questions we got to answer for the video. Thank you so much to everyone who's been providing such interesting things to research, and I'm looking forward to making a part 3 in the future. In the meantime, I still have ideas for other standalone stats videos to come, and we'll be continuing them up until Breath of the Wild 2's release, whenever that drops, as I'll definitely start making stats videos for that game then. But in the meantime, thank you all so much to everyone for watching. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like and subscribe here so you won't miss any future videos to come. Also, a huge shout out to my amazing patrons and YouTube members for supporting the channel. If you would like to help me out here as well, all the info can be found in the description below. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.